Um, uh, listen, guys, uh, I don't think I have to introduce Kevin. Um, quite a seasoned photographer, very good researcher. Um, Kevin has got a good background behind him of even writing books, besides what he has done in the photography uh, world on our island and for the benefit of all lovers of photography. Um, uh, now, I just leave it in Kevin's hands and I've got not, not, nothing else to say. Uh, please feel free just to uh, ask any questions. Uh, you can write them down on, on the comments and I'll, I'll be looking at them. And my, I, if they are uh, pertinent to, to what Kevin is saying, obviously I will uh, uh, ask and uh, maybe interrupt Kevin. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Charles, and welcome to everybody who's joined us this evening uh, for for this session. Uh, I love I love researching on photographers on what has gone before us, and I am always amazed with what they managed to do with the equipment they had. I mean, the, naturally, the further you go towards when photography actually started, the more amazed one is. But even in the era that we're going to be talking about, we'll be talking around 1900 to 1950s. Again, you can imagine equipment wasn't wasn't the same that we have today. It was much more difficult to to work uh, with the equipment they had. But still, it's amazing the amount of iconic photographs that photographers manage to churn out year after year. And it's always a, it's always a great pleasure to give you an idea of some some photographers that I've studied uh, and I actually admire. Today we're going to talk uh, on American Margaret Bourke White. Actually, she was born Margaret White, but then she changed her. He added she added Bourke later on in her life to um, more or less to market herself in a better way. So uh, she is, she was born in 1904 in New York. Uh, parents Min Minnie Burke, who, who she later took her, her surname and did it on, and Joe White. Her fa father was an engineer designer in the printing industry and also an enthusiastic photographer. I mean, a part-time photographer, not a full-time person. Uh, in fact, when we look a lot at um, Margaret's work, you can see that the engineering designing of her father must have influenced her in her actual photography, in the way she composed, and also in the subjects she was very good at and had a passion for. Um, her father, as I said, Joe White, had built the first printing press for Bray. Bray is um, the, the system of for, for blind people to be able to enable them to read. Okay, so it's a, he was a, quite a, a great inventor. But uh, yet he was never a businessman, as money did not really interest him. He was more of a person who was into um, trying to invent things and projects and stuff, but not really interested a lot in the money. We know of a lot of people like that who sort of are, are very famous in what they did, but generally did not really make the money. Um, the couple had three children. Okay, Roger, and uh, apart from Margaret, there was Roger and uh, a sister who was called Ruth. Uh, here we see a very, very old picture done by, by their father of Margaret Burke White. Um, Margaret had a very, very strong bond with her father, with her mother. Uh, and she actually resembled more her mother, although in her thoughts and in her experiences, she was very much into what her father was interested in, but she was more stronger bond with her mother. Her father was quite quiet and always at his home. Um, so the parents, although although they were very, 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 uh, had, a, had this, this great bond with, with their children, the father was more interested in what he was doing in a way, very much absorbed. And the mother, like, like nearly all families, was more interested in raising the children. So naturally, um, the children usually had a much, I remember even ourselves, we had a much stronger bond normally with our mother than with our father, although uh, because the father would be naturally out trying to 
earn a living for, for, for the whole family. So who would still be less there? Um, both parents were interested in natural history, and in fact, Margaret Bourke White says she was she started nearly more as a biologist than a photographer because she was, she too was very interested uh, in what was happening in the natural history field. Her father also taught her to be fearless, to be brave, which is something quite quite nice for that time, because as as you say, as we as you all know, I mean women were considered more as a stay, stay at home and not to go out in the working field. But what really changed things for women was the Second World War, uh, where they had to all go out in the, in the, in the working field because most of the males were, uh, were, were soldiers out on, at war. So they had to take up what the, um, the male would be doing in peacetime. So that way they got uh, they made great strides in emancipation, but her, also her father, as I said, um, taught her, listen, if you want to do something, don't think about um, your gender, just do it. Uh, this is another shot by her father, by Margaret's father of Roger, her brother. And we continue a little more on her biography. In fact, in nine, between 1922 and 27, she attended the American universities, different ones. And when her father eventually died, the family was rather hard up. In fact, uh, the first camera that she, that her mother could buy her, uh, had a, a crack on its lens. It was a three and a quarter inch by four, four and a quarter inch ICA reflex camera. Uh, she started photography as a hobby, hobby whilst at one of the universities. Uh, as it, she, she quickly became attracted to, to, to photography, both as a, as a craft and as a science, as well as to what the camera could, could actually do. Um, at first, she tried unsuccessfully to work as a waitress, actually, uh, again, to, to try and make, make up for her, her father's uh, her father's death and help around with with the family. But eventually, after doing a bit of a stint as a waitress, naturally she wasn't very happy with the job, and she tried to do her best uh, with her camera. It's something that a, a lot of us do relate, because I know that a lot of us have started photography as a hobby, or as a means to supplement one's income, and then some of us have managed to turn to it and make it our professional profession. It has been, and it's, it's always very difficult to do that. Um, her mother, this is a quote from her mother. Margaret, you can always be proud that you were invited into the world. So they were very much, uh, her father and mother were very much the, um, not the pessimists, I mean, they, 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 they felt that coming into life, being born, was actually a privilege that one had to, um, had to nurture and, and enjoy. Her father was also a perfectionist uh, and had a love of the truth. More or less, these traits went into his daughter, who actually found them very, very um, useful when she started doing her career in photography. Margaret herself, at 19, remember her father had already died, uh, married a certain Everett Ch Chapman, who was a professor when both of them were still at college. As you can see, at 19, a uh, very young age, I, I guess, um, she felt that it, she, she could maybe get a better life being married. Uh, it didn't turn out very well because her mother-in-law was very hostile to her and her relationship with her mother-in-law um, made the marriage last just two years. So at 21, she finished. Uh, can you please switch off your mics? I'm still hearing mics. Um, Margaret Burkwai started, tried selling her first photographs at college, actually. And she decided to go into architectural photography, as not many photographers were doing that type of photography. Uh, as always, one tries to find uh, a niche 
where one can maybe earn some money, which again was not easy. Uh, remember that she was going into photography as a profession in a, in a time when a lot of immigrant photographers from all over Europe and were very good photographers had, because of the, uh, the, the, the Second World War and its aftermath, have, had moved to America. So you can imagine how fierce competition was. Uh, eventually, she, she actually dropped biology as a subject at her university to concentrate more on photography. Uh, here, then there was a very good break by her, um, for her actually, because at Columbia University, she started studying art and took a short course, which was only uh, two hours a week, uh, but with Clarence H. White. Clarence H. White, for those who have not heard of him, was a very famous art and photography tutor in America who, um, who pushed forward a lot uh, the educational system and also particularly in the, in the art world. Meeting him uh, inspired her to much better heights because he, he was a man who could inspire people actually. Um, slowly, slowly, through uh, even um, the, the help of, Cl of Clarence White, she actually built an, an architectural portfolio, which is a portfolio with, with architect's image, and started going to companies and offices. So this is, again, this is a, an example of not taking up a camera and waiting for jobs to, to fall in your lap. She, she did something about it. She got, got going. All right, and that's how determination uh, breeds success. And actually, she eventually she started getting some small jobs. A, a, a nice note which I read in her biography was that she actually was very like her father. She was a perfectionist and very meticulous. She would take notes of what she would wear at an interview so that she would never go with the same clothes uh, at another interview. <laughs> um, she started marketing herself as the Burke White Studio, which was nothing more than a set of trays in the kitchen working at night because she could not even blank out light in the kitchen. So uh, as you see, a very hard start. I, I also remember myself starting out my first darkroom was in my in what ended up to be my marital home in Birkirkara whilst I was building it. So you can imagine I used to set up my dark room every time I wanted to work in the dark room and everywhere would be full of dust. Those of you who have printed black and white know what that means. Uh, but where there's a will always there's a way. That's what I always say. In 1927, before, before the Second World War, she moved to New York and managed to start working more regularly as a freelance photography, mainly, mainly on industrial and architectural work, which were her first real passions, genres of photography. Uh, actually, here she was the time that where she combined uh, her, her last name with her mother's maiden name, Bork. It was mainly a marketing ploy because it sounded nicer. This is a, one, a, one of her very first pictures that she managed to, to sell. In fact, um, it's called Preacher and Pigeons, 1928, shot in America, naturally. Uh, and it, it was taken <laughs> with a borrowed camera because she didn't even have a decent camera uh, from a guy called Alfred Hall Bemis, a clerk at a photo goods store in New York. He was actually a person who also helped Margaret Burke White to start in photography because he was always giving her tips and helping her with um, with equipment that she would otherwise would have never had in her hands. Remember, she was coming from a family which her father had already died, uh, so they were very hard up. In fact, Bemis helped her to set up a dark room and also taught her the dark room techniques. And uh, Little by little, Margaret managed to make a, a, an easy, a meager living, I mean, out of shooting gardens and architecture and industrial work on her own. 
she, she started managing selling a picture or two to publishers. So you can imagine um, it was a very slow, difficult process. In fact, Beam is actually also used to, I've, I've read it somewhere else, give her um, old expired negative film from, from where he who used to work so that you could experiment with it. I remember myself actually doing that. Uh, this is one of her industrial photographs. I, I love the way she did it. You can see even, um, I mean, the, 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 all, all the circles of composition and then broken up with the spokes and then the, exactly where she put the two figures that show the scale of, of these industrial um, objects and to give again that little human element in pictures. She loved placing the human element in the, in the photographs. As I always say, putting people in, in pictures is always a, a bonus for, for everybody who sees the, the images because people like to see people. From the same uh, set, these are ter turbines actually, big giant turbines. Um, at one time, she got really into wanting to shoot steel mills from inside. Uh, and she started inquiring and trying to, to get permission to go into there. I mean, imagine um, a, young, a young woman wanting to go into these mines and, and stuff to take photographs again at the around 1930. So one has to think about the mentality of that time as well and how difficult it must have been for her to not only get permission to actually, but to actually go in and shoot and come out with certain images such as this one that we are seeing now. Uh, actually, eventually she was given permission to stay at the steel mills for five months uh, night after night, because mostly she would be shooting at night over there, and it became actually, one would say, her school, where she really um, was working in very difficult conditions. Remember, no portable flesh, nothing. I mean, that time, you, you, she was mainly shooting with the bulbs that would be inside the mines on film that was not usually so fast. All right, maybe 400 eyes so or 800 eyes so pushed in the dark room. So again, uh, the difficulties of photographing such objects. Uh, but her mind photographs were uh, made some people start start looking up. And in 1929, she got another big break. Actually, a Fortune magazine, which later became Life. You know, everybody has heard of Life magazine. It is still known till today as one of the bastions of great photography. Uh, but at that time, it was starting off. Very, um, and even uh, Time, which is, an, which is another magazine, was just five years old. Uh, she started being commissioned to work for the, these magazines. Uh, and a lot of it, her work in the industry uh, helped her a lot to come out with this type of work, which went well with editorial content and text inside these magazines. Okay, this is a picture done in California, 1937. Another industrial image from the same shoot that we said we saw earlier, and here we see other other work. Uh, this is actually a, a, a microphone of that time. <laughs> And this is very interesting. As you can see, her composition is quite um, very attractive and punchy. She, 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 na she rarely shot things as one would see them, but tried to find different angles at, uh, and, and types of lighting, which made the, the picture, uh, pictures of industry, nearly semi-abstract. In 1930, Fortune, the magazine, which very later, as I said, it was life, sent her to Krupp Ironwork. So 1930, remember, before the war and Hitler was on his way to, to gain political power in Germany. Um, 
And then after that, Krupp Ironworks, where we know that Krupp was the biggest, uh, it, it's a, it was a German, old German family, traditional family, who uh, were very much into heavy, heavy iron industry. Uh, later on, she was sent also to Russia to cover the Soviet Union. Again, as I said, after Russia had been a closed door for quite some time. The industrial age was coming into very much into being. Unfortunately, then it took uh, a very, very long turning because it became more or less involved in in making machinery and arms uh, of, of destruction instead of things that would help society. But again, like in all wars, industry um, is forced to improve. And then maybe after the war finishes, we get uh, the benefit of that, that type of, of big industry. Uh, her, the picture she had done got her a visa to the Soviet Union, and they were the first photographs by a non-Soviet citizen. In fact, this is Margaret said Russia was a lesson in patience. Why? Because she had a lot of problems. Uh, although she had visa and permission at the beginning to photograph her where she wanted, wherever she went, she was met naturally with bureaucratic uh, problems, and each factory would limit the way she, she would work and where she would go in. Because as we said, I mean, uh, it was the, the, the communist era and they weren't very keen. They were only keen to show what they wanted to show. Uh, this is a picture which was published in life, as you can see, which I think is very, very extremely powerful. Uh, it shows the, the hard life at that time in Russia. Uh, actually, she she also did manage to do two two movie films, two documentary films, Eyes of, of Russia and Red Republic. It, they are the only ones she ever actually did. Um, later on, in, uh, her mother died as well of heart attack, so, so she was left by herself. And in 19, 1936, when Life was born, she became uh, one of the first four staff photographers for Life magazine. This, this picture of Stalin is actually her, her image, her portrait. Uh, she also, when during um, a period, she was working as well a lot from doing photography inside banks, the architectural work and and promotional photography for them. And in fact, when she when there was the great stock market crash of 1930 in America, she was actually photographing inside the bank at the time. And she was doing advertising and commercial work as well. Her images, as you can see, are a very important social record of whatever she shot, particularly in places like Russia, India, and also in the United States, naturally. This is an iconic photograph that she took um, over New York. As you can see, the skyline, the Empire State Building. I think it's a fantastic image. The contrast that there is of the the, 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 the tones of the plane with, with the rest makes the image outstanding. I, I never stop looking at this picture. A shot of the Statue of Liberty, not as we usually see her. Again, it's what I always say, even to students. I mean, try and always search the different angle, the, the, the viewpoint that others are not really seeing, because that will make your work different, outstanding. Um, in During that time, uh, the Bank of Manhattan was in, in New York. You, we had, there were two buildings which were the highest. One was the Bank of Manhattan, which was 917 feet, and the Chrysler Building, which was 1,000 feet. At that time, they were record heights. Uh, in fact, you took pictures from the Chrysler building in midwinter in very cold temperatures. And uh, eventually she made, she made up her studio on the 61st floor of the Chrysler building. 
because as her work increased, she started making enough money and to live a better life and in fact establish a studio in that iconic building. Uh, in fact, also, she kept two pet alligators, small ones and two turtles. She loved animals, actually, in the same apartment. I don't know how she got the permission, but anyway. Uh, these are the actual images of her shooting from the top of the Chrysler building. You can see the guts she had, you know. Um, in fact, she's more or less outside one of the windows, uh, outside her studio window which was 800 feet uh, up. And some other photographer took her taking the actual pictures. She was a fearless woman. She never um, shied away from danger. In 1934, there came the famous or infamous Dust Bowl, the great draft of, drought of uh, 1934 in Texas. Um, she was commissioned for five days to cover this and had her own plane transport. I mean, she wasn't driving it, but she had a plane to go to, to places quite quickly. Uh, and in fact, this this assignment um, marked her for the, for the rest of her life because she saw the suffering of the farmers and their families. I mean, it was so bad, the drought, that they lost all their crops. Uh, people were literally dying of hunger. Uh, in fact, this is a, a quote by her about her pictures of the drought. How could I tell it all in pictures? Here were faces engraved with the very paralysis of despair. These were faces I could not pass by. After that, she found it very difficult to go back to shooting commercial photography or simple things that she was shooting before and making quite a good living out of. But as I said, the, the drought bowl, the, 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 the dust bowl affected her so much that she started trying to take assignments which meant something to her, which were uh, either creative or constructive or passing a message. In fact, she even refused at that time uh, $1,000 to do an advertising picture. So her work started slowly changing. Instead of going more on the aesthetic and the commercial, she started going more on uh, the way American society was developing in what were difficult years. She started doing get a type of photograph which showed actually what was happening in America at that time. Um, Erskine Caldwell Cotton was Erskine Caldwell was a very good was a very famous um, writer, American writer at that time, and uh, eventually she had met him and started. They started a book together called Tobacco Road, uh, photographing in the cotton areas, cotton growing areas of the deep south of America. Uh, they tackled the issue of segregation and the life of sharecroppers. Sharecroppers would be where farmers who would pay the rent of their fields through, uh, through giving a part of their crop because they would not have enough money to pay for, their, for the rent of their fields. It would be a sort of barter agreement. Naturally, the farmers were always left with the small end of the stick in, in such deals. Um, before this, she had disengaged from commercial work before going on the, this, this, this type of photography in the South and also left her penthouse studio. The alligators went to actually an experimental school. <laughs> Uh, she moved studio to to somewhere else, to 521 Fifth Avenue, which was a bigger place. And at that time, she started affording a staff of eight people. As you can see, her income and her standing started increasing, increasing, increasing every year, every year. So the success was naturally obtained. Um, her relationship with Erskine, who was the, the writer of the book, was at first quite cold and problematic um, because Erskine was rather uncommunicative and they had a lot of problems while doing this book. 
Uh, eventually, but Erskine um, asked her to marry him. Actually, while she was working in the Arct Arctic, sending a telegram over there. But she realized that her first loyalty was to Life magazine and to her work. So uh, she actually refused. This is the cover of the book um, by Erskine Caldwell and Margaret Work White. And this is a quote from actually from Caldwell. And I'd like to direct it to people who are starting in photography because we always have a lot of mixed feelings. I have a lot of people asking me for um, for critique or assessment of their work. And then, unfortunately, if the, if the assessment is adverse, is not to their liking, they take it against not only me, but also against anyone who is giving them um, feedback. Feedback is very important. And this quote by Caldwell, I think, encapsulates it all. You do not learn much from praise, you learn from adverse criticism. If we were to put it into today's contest, I don't I think you do not learn much from having your family post likes on your pictures, but you learn from when somebody is actually assessing the image constructively naturally. In 1941, as we said, Caldwell and Burke White went to Russia together. Again, for life, it was the second time she was going to Russia, and war broke out between Russia and Germany. Um, no cameras were being allowed. She had a lot of problems. But one of the most must have been iconic uh, moments in her life is that when eventually she was allowed to photograph Stalin, uh, she actually went with re dressed in red shoes and a red bow. And that must have pleased Stalin as well. And she was just allowed to take two pictures. I mean, imagine today you are you are summoned by by a president or something, and you're just allowed to take two images. Uh, eventually, she got married in 1939 again, the second time. Uh, and it was again with Erskine because eventually she got used to the to, to him in, in a very good way. He got used as well to the way she would her work would take a lot of importance in their life together. And they got together and eventually at last married in 1939, just before the Second World War started. In fact, they ended up working on three books together. Uh, the Second World War actually separated them again, as she really wanted to go to photograph war. And Caldwell was had a very good Hollywood offer, staying over in America to write books and biographies. Um, they quickly realized they were leading separate lives. Again, it was a big mistake. Um, their marriage was a big mistake. He was quite jealous of her career and of her freedom and wanted to try and sort of curb that freedom and uh, naturally he didn't succeed because Margaret was very headstrong and wanted to do her own thing. Uh, in fact, they say they had five good years, but then everything went sour. Um, she photographed during her career with, with life. She photographed all the top people like Churchill. In fact, if you search for Life magazine and covers on in of her work. Uh, King George of Britain, Stalin, Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, etc. The people who were very much in the news at that time. She actually became the first woman war correspondent embedded with the United States Air Force, naturally with her life accreditation. And they had a, made a uniform for her because, I mean, so that she, she would really look, look quite well in it. And initially, she was barred from the combat zone, but naturally, she managed to get there as well. Here we start seeing um, some of her images. Um, the, the bottom one where we see the, the, these people on a train were actually refugees from Berlin moving out. And she started going all over the place again through actually covering for Time and Life magazines, both of them. Um, 
several areas. Here we see uh, soldiers in Syria. Uh, very, very impo important uh, photograph. On one, at one time when she was going on an African uh, assignment, the ship she was on, the destroyer she was on, was torpedoed. And after drifting for quite some time, they were eventually safely picked up by a destroyer. Uh, after this adventure, she ended up again with the Allied forces going up in the invasion of Italy, the retaking of Italy, when the Allies landed in Sicily. Uh, she stayed a lot with medical orderlies, with, with, the, with doctors and stuff like that. And unfortunately, two packages of films that she shot were lost uh, when, when they, after they arrived at Pentagon sensors. This was very much a, a common theme in that time, because remember, um, films had to be processed or else sent to be processed away from the war zones. And there was the big chance of them getting lost or damaged or destroyed. In fact, she had a whole bag of, of films which were stolen during her, the Italian campaign. And in fact, she had to redo the work all over again. This is in Italy, military hospital in 1945 during her stay in Italy during that time, during the war. Here we see a very um, promotional, I would say, portrait of her in her tailor-made uniform, American uniform, um, in England in 1942. Um, she, would say, she would say that uh, sometimes on flying missions, when they would go a very high altitude, this was a problem at that time, uh, temperatures would really fall, fall down, and the film would actually freeze and, and break. Uh, when you start pulling it or turning turning the the, the the roll inside the camera, it would be frozen and it would break and you wouldn't be able to do much, uh, much more before going down and changing uh, the film and the camera. These are all promotional work, also for promoting the US Army and, and the Air Force. As you can see, here is a post photographs. Naturally, the Americans, like all other others during the war, were using photography uh, as a main means of uh, glorifying more or less the war, etc., etc., as, as every, every country does when involved in a war. They hide the atrocities and show the sort of nice things about the adventure of, photo of war. Again, she was very much at ease with people, and particularly with, with, with males. This image is quite nice. It shows the cramped conditions in, a, in, an, in an American bomber. And she actually started becoming like a pin-up for, for the Americans, you know, because um, she she was she, she epitomized the American dream sort of coming out from nowhere, making a success of herself. And also the emancipation bit of helping women to get more emancipated through the way she was living her life. Another very um, meaningful moment for her was 1945 when she arrived with the with the army of General Patton, the American. She arrived in Buchenwald, which was uh, one of the worst concentration camps. Uh, and she took some of the photographs, the first photographs at that concentration camp. Uh, she, she felt that she was so shocked with what she was photographing that she she was doing things like automatically, only only really realizing what she had shot when she started seeing the printed pictures from the dark room. Uh, this is a picture we had mentioned, Krupp, the German industrialist. 
uh, very well known, um, and she took up a portrait of him when he was under house arrest, because naturally, uh, being one of the major sources of uh, German industry, he was arrested as soon as the war finished. She did a lot of photography after the war in Germany, which was, as you can imagine, all broken up. It was totally, um, everything was bombed out, particularly places like Berlin and uh, the other industrial areas which had been bombed by the Allies. It was very hard for people to try and get back to live properly. This is again an overcrowded train departing from Berlin, because Berlin was one of the most worst hit uh, cities of, of Germany. So a lot of people after the war were trying to leave to try and make a living elsewhere. Some other images of hers. The one at the bottom is a Russian tank, tank crew. And the one here you can see I mean, needs no explanation. When the war ended, she was assigned again by uh, by Life and Time magazine to, to India in 1946. And she met um, Gandhi, the Indian um, activist. She says of him, naturally, he made a very, very big impression on her. And she says he was one of the saintliest men I have ever met. She, for two years, she covered the split between India and Pakistan, where millions actually died. As you know, the, um, the, the British wanted to leave India at that time. They couldn't afford to keep it, keep it as, the, as a colony. Uh, then they split it up. And who was Muslim in the Hindu area had to go to the Pakistan area and vice versa. And there was a lot of actual ethnic violence, which killed millions of people again and, and thousands. And there was exodus from one side of the country to another. It was a, a horrific, one of the most horrific times that India and actually, actually Pakistan passed through. Um, when she wanted to, uh, to photograph Gandhi, Gandhi said Gandhi had a, a sort of rule for everybody who wanted to, to photograph him. They had to know how something about spinning, because he was always um, using spinning as, a, as something that not only was therapy, but it was something that showed the simplicity uh, of life in India and of how through industry, India could could get up off her feet. So he wasn't using it only as a, something, a pastime or something. Spinning for Gandhi was very important. It was a, a message. Um, when she first tried to photograph Gandhi, she went on Monday, but he could, she couldn't do it because every Monday he would not, he would not speak to anybody. It would be his day of silence and recollection. Uh, when she eventually got in, uh, conditions were very dark. Um, and during the first, her first session, everything went really wrong. Even her, her camera was not synchronizing with the flash bulbs that she had. But naturally, she persisted and she came out with a lot of photographs uh, eventually of Gandhi. Gandhi playfully used to call her the torturer because she was very insistent <laughs> and wanted him to pose here and there, etc. Uh, it actually contradicted Gandhi as he considered machinery evil. Uh, during that time, as we said, of religious fanatism, when, when there was this great migration, uh, six million people were actually on the move. And she would follow uh, the, the, the convoys of, of migrants from one, one area to another. Uh, in fact, she said that the fighting on, uh, during the Indian separation looked very much like, like the concentration camps. It was that bad. Here are some pictures of my, Indian migration.
In fact, it is estimated that over one million were were died during this this period in India. It was great hardship. She was during um, over there when Gandhi had was making his 16th fast. He was always uh, protesting and fasting. Fasting, he used to use fasting as a way of protest against um, political issues and, and decisions. Unfortunately, Gandhi, as you well know, was assassinated by a Hindu fanatic. And it was just after a few hours after an interview by Margaret Burke White. And who used so her photographs are the last that were taken of Gandhi before he died. He was assassinated. In fact, she says nothing in all my life has affected me more deeply. That this one one Christ like man who had died to bring unity to his people. In fact, there are two very good films, good movies, um, quite factual, actually, as I saw them both uh, on this meeting between Margaret Burke White and uh, Gandhi. Uh, here we see Estill uh, by, of Ben Kingsley and Candice Bergen, who was playing the part of Margaret here. In fact, this is a actually she, she has the same camera that she used to that Burke White used to prefer when taking portraits, etc. In fact, there was a then a later film, which was called Double Exposure. And again, this is this was a more of a glorified type of movie. The first one is much more factual. But still, they are two good movies that are worth seeing, particularly if you're interested in her life and uh, which was really interesting and her work. Uh, after the war and after Gandhi, she, she did some of some work in South Africa during the apartheid days. Again, very impressive work, very photojournalistic. And in '52, um, she went to Korea, where the, the guerrillas were so enraged with her photography, were showing them in a very bad light that they put actually a price on her head. In fact, she would carry always an escort when where possible and uh, and a cult for, for her own protection. Some of her images, again, very graphic. At a later time, she started going back to writing, um, mainly because of her influence with Erskine Caldwell when she had got worked with him. And then she started uh, getting quite a, a good balance in her late years, switching from periods of adventure to more reflective uh, periods of writing. She never had any children, so she remained more or less very independent. Um, there are a lot of books written both by Margaret Burke White and also um, by others on her. I highly recommend this one, the autobiography of Margaret Bull White. It's a very, very intimate, nice book on her. Unfortunately, in 1952, she contracted Parkinson's disease. However, she, she continued to photograph and write. Um, eventually retiring from the magazine in 1969. So she, she was one of the first photographers of Life magazine at its onset and one of those who, who worked so many years uh, throughout so many historical events uh, in, in society. Uh, Margaret Bourke White died quite peacefully, in fact, in 1971 in Connecticut, where she had retired for the last uh, few years. This is a very stylized photograph of her at her best. And I end with this quote from, from her, uh, which quite sums up, I think, her character. Nothing attracts me like a closed door. I cannot let my camera rest until I have pried it open. It's, it's talking about the inquisitiveness of a good photographer 
and of always wanting to research, to, to see, to experience. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you have found this interesting.